Welcome uh, learners to our financial markets law class. We are looking at our topic number three, lesson two, where we are looking at the central depository system. Uh, in this second lesson on the central depository system, we want to look at the following issues. First, we want to discuss the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation. Then we shall move on to see how you establish how you establish uh, a central depository in Kenya. We will discuss the duties the duties of the depository. We shall also look at the rules, the rules of the depository. Then we shall move on to look at the central depository agents, particularly on the registration the registration of the central depository agents and some specific functions that these central depository agents must be discharging. Then we shall look at security issues. These are security measures that are supposed to be maintained by every other depository. And in particular regard, we shall address the issue of access to computerized systems. In particular, we shall be looking at the particular offenses that have been created by the depositories uh, uh, legislation on matters and lawful access into these computerized systems uh, that are to be operated by the depository. Um, besides security, we are also going to dis uh, discuss the issue of disclosures, certain disclosures that may be made by these depositories that will be within the law and then finally, we shall discuss the guarantee fund. We shall discuss the guarantee fund that is required by law to be maintained by the depositories. So class, if you notice, this second lesson follows our first lesson where we generally discuss central depository systems and the need for central depository systems. Now, in this second lesson, we are particularly addressing the Kenyan scenario where we are looking at one of the depositories we have licensed in Kenya. That is the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation, a limited company in Kenya. Um, besides that company, we also want to look at if you wish to have your depository registered by the Capital Markets Authority, what procedure would you have to follow in the establishment of your depository? Then besides the establishment, it is important that we also inform you what duties these depositories, the central depositories are expected to be discharging, including rules that these dis depositories are going to maintain uh, for the purposes of the agents who they admit, the agents that they may register to act as, as an intermediary between the depository and the investors. Then talking about the agents, we also have a discussion coming up on the central depository agents. So how do you get registered as a depository agent by a specific depository? Issues to do with the application, the criteria that has to be considered, and then ultimately, we also want to discuss the functions of these depositor depository agents. Then matter security become very important. Uh, there is a legal requirement, as we shall see with the uh, dep depositories legislation, on matters to do with keeping of information um, by a depository and matters to do with access to their computerized systems. There are some offenses that have been prescribed by law that we would wish to allude to. Then matters to do with disclosures, what sort of information and under what circumstances may these depositories or their agents be allowed to share information relating to their account holders. Then finally, matters to do with this fund, the guarantee fund to be maintained by a depository. So let's begin where we must, and that is on matters, the central depository and settlement 
Corporation. Now, it, we should note that this CDSC is a limited company incorporated in Kenya under the Companies Act. Now, this, this was way back in um, the year 1999, 1999. So that should have been the Companies Act, uh, Chapter 487. We now have a new Companies Act. That is the Companies Act of 2015. But this is when this corporation was uh, brought to life. They are getting incorporated in 1999 as a central depository corporation that is formed for the purposes of handling deliveries and settlement of securities transaction. Now, it was not until the year 2000 that the CDSC got its license uh, from the Capital Markets Authority, authorizing them to act as a central depository in matters relating to the delivery and settlement of corporations. Now, following their licensing in the year 2000, uh, we would have to wait all the way till the year 2004 when the CDSC began its operations as a central depository system. So this is one of the depositories we have in Kenya that has been licensed by the Capital Markets Authority under the Depository Central Depositories Act. Uh, this license grants them uh, the permission to proceed and operate depository activity. So they would provide that facility, that system of depositing of securities. They will provide that facility for enabling transactions uh, in relation to uh, securities in this country. Now, besides the CDAC, we can have other companies uh, licensed by the Capital Markets Authority to operate a central depository system. But the question is, how do you establish a central depository system? establishment of a depository. How do you establish a central depository system? Now, any other corporation out there registered under the Companies Act that wishes to be licensed by the Capital Markets Authority to operate as a depository, they will be required to make an application they would be required to make an application, and this application is to be made to the Capital Markets Authority, consistent with the CDS rules. And this is an application for registration as an operator of a depository. Now, this application comes with it some uh, application fees. Comes with it some application fees. We are in the business of collecting fees. Every other time that anything has to be registered, then fees has to be collected. It's an opportunity that the CMA would not miss to collect some fees from these applicants. Now, this application must also be meeting some requirements. Uh, it must meet some set out requirements uh, by CMA. These are requirements that must accompany this application. Now, if the CMA is satisfied that the applicant has met the set out criteria, then they may proceed on to grant them a license to operate a depository. And of course, as you would know, if this application does not meet the criteria by CMA, they would not be granting uh, this license. Now, we may just want to point out to some of the conditions or some of the requirements that CMA is going to insist uh, in terms of who gets this license to operate a depository and who does not get a license to operate a depository. Now, some of the important conditions that CMA will insist on having uh, these corporations that make an application meet are matters to do with uh, their board, that the applicant must have a board with that specific composition as per the requirements of the Capital Markets Authority. The CMA would insist on the diversity of the board. The CMA would insist on the diversity of the experience of the board. So we have this board composition that appreciates um, a variety of skills. We have this board composition that appreciates systems of corporate governance. So probably we are looking at the presence of uh, executive directors and as uh, and as well having also the non-executive directors uh, being on board. We also have matters to do with minimum capital requirements. Minimum capital requirements. This is an issue as well. Uh, 
it speaks to whether this corporation is going to be able to meet uh, the financial demands of running its operation. So we may have a minimum amount of capital that may be prescribed by the Capital Markets Authority that every other applicant wishes to be licensed as an operator of a depository that they should be meeting. Besides uh, cap the, the capital requirements, there would be issues to do with infrastructure requirements. Does this applicant have the necessary infrastructure to run a depository? Now, infrastructure in this case, I want us to think about maybe an ICT platform. Remember, we are looking at an electronic system of hosting, an electronic facility for depositing these securities. So does the applicant have the appropriate and uh, up-to-date ICT facilities to host uh, this depository? Besides this infrastructure, personnel issues, personnel issues would also come to the fore. Uh, does the applicant have the staff, the manpower that has the, requi the requisite uh, skills and experience to run a depository system? So if these conditions have been met, then the Capital Markets Authority may go ahead to grant a license to this applicant authorizing them to run a depository system. And I believe that is now what has happened with the CDSC, that they have made an application, to, they made an application to the uh, Capital Markets Authority, and having met these criteria and these application procedures, they were granted a license to operate a depository system. Now, once you have been licensed to operate, we now want to look at the specific duties that you will have to discharge as a depository. Duties of a depository. The duties of a depository. Now, they have everything to do with... Um, the, the mobilization of security, the securities, all matters to do with custody, all matters to do with um, dematerialization of securities, matters to do with um, transactions in respect to these uh, securities, matters to do with the recording of these, uh, 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 matters to do with records, record keeping on the transactions affecting these securities. So if we can look at some specifics on these duties, they will include the following. One, we have immobilization, immobilization of securities. We also have facilitating deposits and withdrawal. of certificates. They also have to facilitate dematerialization. It is also part of their business to maintain securities accounts. It is also part of their business to facilitate uh, the transfer the transfer of securities. It is also part of their business to operate to operate the securities to operate the securities, to operate the securities account. So class, if you look at this, it is everything that we are describing as the custody of these securities, the recording of all the transactions in relation to the securities, and facilitation of any transfers in respect to these securities. If you look at it from the first one, we talk about immobilization of securities. Immobilization, if you remember from our previous class, it is about taking custody, depositing of security certificates with the depository. It is part of their primary business. And if you think about it, it should be the beginning point. Once holders of title 
or once the holders of this uh, security, the title to these securities, they deposit them with the depository for custody. It is that depositing of these securities with the depository that we are referring to as the immobilization of these securities. Now, once they have been immobilized, then we come into the element of facilitating the depositing and withdrawing of these certificates. The, take, the giving, the handing over of custody, it is the depositing element. Those who wish to have them collected, it is the withdrawal of these certificates. It's part of the immobilization process. Now, should these holders of these securities wish to have transactions effected uh, in respect of their securities, then dematerialization becomes uh, necessary. Remember, again, from our previous class, we discussed dematerialization as the process of converting physical certificates or physical securities into an electronic format. Remember, these transactions will be carried out on an electronic format uh, or platform so that dematerialization becomes necessary, that these securities in a physical form, in a certificate form, be converted into an electronic form to facilitate electronic transfers or electronic transactions in respect of our securities. Now, maintaining records, uh, maintaining securities accounts, now this account is going to be necessary to capture all the transactions relating to these securities. So whether they have, they, have, they have been bought, whether they are being sold, then it is in this securities account that these transactions are to be maintained. Transfers, so any holders of securities wishing to sell them, any holders of security, any, any persons wishing to purchase or buy securities, then again the depository is going to enable these uh, transfers to be necessary. Then ultimately the operations of the securities account. Operations in this case could include the buying and the selling. All this falls within the core duties every other depository should be able to handle. So with our CDAC, Having made an application, then you can now see what duties would be expected of the depository to run. The Central Depository and Settlement Corporation and any other that may be licensed by the Capital Markets Authority to carry out or to offer depository services. Now, these depositories, as a requirement by law, they should have some rules, some sort of regulations. Remember, uh, regulation has been a big issue as far as our capital markets are concerned. That regulations are necessary for efficiency, regulations are necessary for transparency, regulations are going to be necessary for investor confidence. So once you have been licensed as a, uh, as a depository, there is a requirement by the Capital Markets Authority that you must have rules, you must have some regulations by which any central depository agents are going to play by that these rules are going to define the relationship between the central depository and any agents they may license any agents they may register to handle investors on their behalf so let us now look at uh, these um, rules that the central depositories are required by law to prescribe for the central depository agents. So the rules of the central depository system are going to be rules in relation to the following matters. One, we have rules relating to deposits. And registration of securities. We have also rules relating to settlement of transactions. We have rules on matters efficiency of operations.
we have rules on default processes. And this is particularly by the depository. We have rules relating to the qualifications for appointment as a central depository agent. We have rules relating to the expulsion, suspension, and disciplining of the central depository agents. Now, if you look at this spread of regulations, there are regulations uh, relating to the operations of the central depository. There are regulations re re in respect of how the central depository agents are going to conduct themselves. A and we have pointed out why. Remember, we are looking at the necessity of regulations in every depository system, that they are good for efficiency, they are good for transparency, they are good for investor confidence. Now, what kind of regulations do we have? First, we have regulations in respect to deposit and registration of securities, so that even as the depository recruits any agents to represent these investors, then they are very clear on how deposits and registration of any transfers of securities are going to be recorded. Remember, keeping of records is one of the requirements of the law in respect to the operation of any depository system. It is these records that speak for transparency. It is these records that speak for the integrity of the system. Then they have matters to do with settlement of transactions. This will point out towards issues to do with timelines. By when are these transactions expected to be settled by the agents of the depository? Again, these timelines will be important as they would inform things to do with default processes. What happens if by this time, uh, immobilization dates, dematerialization dates, what happens if these agents have not acted by these set dates, then the default processes by the depository may take effect. The regulations are also going to speak to efficiency of operations. Basically, they will be giving guidelines on what are some of the steps or ingredients of efficient processes that the depository will expect of these agents. Now, to the, deposit, uh, to the default processes. Now, these default processes kick in as a result of a failure by a central depository agent taking action uh, within the appointed or limited times. For instance, on matters to do with the settlement of transactions, if the central depository has set times within which uh, immobilization should be done, timelines within which dematerialization should be done or rematerialization should be done, then any time the agents are in default, they have not acted within those timelines, then a default process kicks in. So these regulations will also speak to these default processes uh, as to when and how the central depository will take action in respect of a default in, a, in action by any of the central depository agents. Very important would also be matters to do with qualifications for appointment as a central depository agent. Not everybody out there is going to get an admission or a registration as an agent of a central depository system. There is a criteria which has to be met. So these regulations would also be speaking to these qualifications. So who qualifies to be registered as an agent of the particular central depository? Then on matters, uh, discipline and conduct, these rules should also be very clear on breach of the set regulations by the central depository. So once an agent is in breach of the regulations, when do they qualify for an expulsion? That is deregistration from the central depository. When are they qualifying for an expulsion from the central deposit, uh, a suspension, sorry. Then ultimately disciplinary processes. So these disciplinary processes Outside expulsion and suspensions could also include some penalties that may be imposed by the central depository 
on any agent on issues to do with failures, defaults. So they have not immobilized in time. They have not immaterialized in time. Failure to record transactions. Failure to settle in good time. So such, such has to be very well spelled out. Remember, one of the good aspects of every other regulatory process, and that is what we all have with these regulations, they should be very clear that we should not be seeing subjecting uh, agents to disciplinary processes haphazardly. We should not be seeing suspending members on the basis of very unclear rules or some being expelled, ex expelled from a central depository on the basis of uh, unclear rules. So they have to be well spelled out in the regulations so that even at the time of admission, these agents know when they will be liable for penalties, they know when they will be liable for a suspension, as well as an expulsion procedure. So this is as a requirement of the Capital Markets Authority that every other depository must be very clear on its regulation, all the way from the admission of agents, how they operate, their processes, including disciplinary measures that they may take against their agents. So that, that is very important that we know about depositories from the establishment, from the duties that they expected to discharge, and from the rules that they are expected to set out uh, for any of their agents and generally on matters relating to their operations from the depositing settlements and other efficiency issues. Now, I want to proceed on now to discuss the central depository agents that these depositories may register. So we now want to look at the central depository agents. the central depository agents and specifically look at how they get themselves registered with the central depositories to act as agents and maybe just to mention some of their key functions. Why do we need these agents registered? Now, any investor, and these are basically institutional investors, any institutional investors or anybody corporate So we are referring to companies here. They may make an application to the CEO. This application is to be directed to the CEO of the depository, the CEO of the central depository, and it is an application to be registered as an agent of that particular central depository. So for instance, if we are talking about the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation in Kenya, and we have this company, X Limited, that is an institutional investor or any other body corporate that is formed and wishes to be registered as a central depository agent, they will be making an application to the chief executive officer of the Central Depository and Settlement Corporation wishing to express the intention to be registered as one of the depository agents. Now, this application has to be accompanied by some documentations or some statutory requirements as per the Act. One of the things that must accompany this application would be the Memorandum of Association and the Articles. The Memorandum of Association and the Articles of Association of the specific body corporate. Now, we intend to see from this memorandum maybe about the incorporation of the company, who are the members of this company, and maybe from the articles we intend to see the internal organization of the company, uh, the internal rules, the internal regulations of this company, just to be satisfied that the internal regulations and the formation of this company is consistent with the objectives of being registered as a depository agent. Now, besides the memorandum and the articles of the company, it is also going to be necessary that we have a profile of the company. A company profile is going to be necessary in the application process. Now, it is from this company profile that the applicant would wish to give some more specific details in terms of their structural a structural organization in terms of the composition of the board, uh, maybe give us details on who their members of the board are, 
uh, they would also give us a summary of the activities, uh, the objectives of, in, of incorporating this company. So what do they do as a company? What are some of the things they have achieved as a company that speak to their towards their qualification to be registered as a depository we would also have such other details as uh, as uh, as regards to the company's head office and so forth so the profile becomes unnecessary uh, in this application besides uh, besides the company profile, we would also want to have uh, a license, and this is license from the Capital Markets Authority, that authorizes this applicant uh, to act as a depository agent. This is necessary. Uh, together with the license and maybe touching on the Capital Markets Authority, we need a letter of no objection. We need a letter of no objection, and this letter is issued by the Capital Markets Authority. And what this letter simply says is that this uh, Capital Markets Authority has no objection whatsoever for this particular agent to be registered as a depository agent. Now, this letter of objection is granted on some criteria. We call it the fitness criteria. Uh, where the capital markets authority is basically going to look at this applicant and they're looking at their financial status uh, do they have risks in terms of uh, insolvency uh, do they have the professional capacity to discharge uh, their duties as a depository agent so against this criteria they may be declared as fit for appointment as depository agents and therefore what the authority now goes on to issue is a letter of no objection where they are simply saying that they do not object. They have no grounds, they have no basis for an objection towards this corp body corporate, this company, from being appointed as a depository agent. The other thing that is also critical in the application process would be a, a, a detail, some profile of key personnel or key officers, key officers of the company, and specifically speaking to their qualifications, speaking to their qualifications and fitness uh, to operate as a depository agent. So they will be pointing out towards some of their key employees. So who do they have in their company? Who are these people that they are going to rely on so much in terms of offering this capacity, in terms of offering these skills that are necessary to act as a depository agent? So with this, with this, with this application criteria as met, we shall also and most definitely ask for some application fees. application fees are going to be necessary following every other successful application. So with all this, then the fees that are prescribed by the particular central depository are going to be levied towards the registration of the particular agent. Now, once we have been registered as this agent for the central depository, what are the functions, what are the services that we are going to offer as an agent? We have mentioned these services before, but just to recap them because it is important for this part. So functions of the central depository agent, functions of the central depository agent. So they perform a number of functions which are important here. Uh, part of it is the collection. Uh, for deposit, collection for deposit of immobilized securities. They will also uh, be submitting requests for withdrawal of certificates. They are also in the business of opening and maintaining securities 
accounts. They are also in the business of allocating trades. to securities accounts. And then they would also be collecting fees. Imposed by the central depository uh, in respect in respect of transactions in respect of transactions. So we we have captured this earlier on when we looked at the regulations aspect, uh, touching on the central depository agents, but they come back to us again. These are the functions that every other registered central depository agent is going to offer as an intermediary between the depository and the investors. First, we we'll relate to the collection of immobilized securities. So once these holders of the securities have deposited uh, their securities uh, with the central depository. It is the business, it is the function of these agents to do the collection of the immobilized securities. Now, in respect of any requests that these holders of the securities may have, maybe for the withdrawal of their certificates, the intermediary, which is the agent in this case, it is their function, it is their duty to make the requests on behalf of these security holders. The opening of securities accounts. So all these persons who have securities and wish to transact on securities, they open and maintain the accounts on behalf of these persons who wish to open securities accounts. Then it is their business to allocate trades to securities accounts. So once you have bought securities or once you're selling shares, these buying and sellings, these transactions are to be allocated or assigned to the specific trading accounts by the, sec uh, the, the central depository uh, agents. And then lastly, collection of fees. So in respect of every other transaction, if there are any fees that have been uh, levied by the central depository, the specific agent handling the specific transacting account becomes the collector of any levies or any fees that have been imposed by the central depository on a single transaction or on every other transaction that has been carried out in respect of an account. So that is what we will expect these agents to do. Now, let me go on to matters security in respect of the central depository and the central depository agents. Security measures that have been prescribed by law to be maintained by the central depository and the central depository agents in respect of the security, uh, the securities accounts that they handle, that they manage. Remember, part of the reasons for regulation was to have our investors having a lot of confidence in our system. Now, to install and grow this confidence, one of the things that we must see happening uh, is about the security measures that have to be put into uh, in place by the, uh, the depository system as well as uh, applying to the, cen uh, the, the central depository agents. Now, this, uh, the depository systems legislation has some specific requirements in terms of security measures to be maintained in respect of these uh, securities accounts. Now, one of the things to add security measures is that um, since uh, these central depository systems are going to share access to their computerized system with their agents, access may also be shared with the securities exchange, then there is a requirement that all these persons interacting with the, uh, the computer system, that is the central depository, that is the securities exchange, and these are the, the, the central depository agents, they have a requirement to put measures. They have a requirement to put measures to safeguard 
information uh, relating to relating to securities securities accounts that they maintain so the first step is that there's an obligation on them on all these parties the cd the, the cds that is the agents the central depository the the system itself and the securities exchange which may be granted access to this computerized system they must have measures in place that safeguard this investor's information now the second extent of the security measures that we have on this is that there is a requirement that these persons they should not they should not disclose information they should not disclose information uh, without they should not disclose information without the consent without the consent of the holders that is the account the account holders now while measures have been put into place to safeguard this information remember this corporate this the, the central depository the central depository agents and the securities exchange continue to access this information now there is an obligation on them that this information that they have accessed should not be disclosed and the only time this information may be disclosed would be with the consent of the holders of these specific accounts now we may also have this information that was held within this computerized system and may have been accessed unlawfully or lawfully. There is an obligation uh, towards the holders of this information of not to continue. There is an obligation not to continue to disclose. There is an obligation not to continue to disclose the information, not to disclose the information obtained. So if it comes to the knowledge of either the, uh, the agents or employees of the central depository or the central depository agents or their employees, that they have with them information that is otherwise confidential and this information has previously been disclosed, they have an obligation not to continue sharing such information. Now, in respect of these prescriptions that we have to put measures, we have, to, uh, we do have, we have no rights to disclose information, and where information has been disclosed, we should not continue to disclose this information. The law imposes some sanctions on this, that any person who acts in violation of these regulations, they are liable to a fine and or an imprisonment an imprisonment term so in terms of the fine we are talking about five million as a maximum in terms of the imprisonment we are talking about five years as a possible minimum so it could go anywhere from zero to five million zero to five years in terms of imprisonment and we say if you are lucky you may get the fine and the imprisonment or an alternative just pay the fine or you you have an imprisonment term prescribed for violating any of this. Then these security measures also go further to regulate matters to do with access of information that is kept in this computerized system. Remember, we are saying this is a shared system. The central depository is going to share this system with the securities exchange. They are also likely to be sharing, this. they will actually be sharing this system with this, the central depository agents. It is only then that the central depository agents are able to effect transactions. They must have access to this depository system so that they are able to record all these transactions. Now, relating to the access, the law makes it criminal to unlawfully, to unlawfully access or attempt or attempt to access to attempt to access this computerized system that holds all this information so it is unlawful access if you have not been granted the rights to access uh, this information so to anybody who does that or attempts to do that it is an offense and similarly this extends to anybody who interferes anybody who interferes or attempts attempts to interfere 
And this, again, we must insist, it has to be unlawful interfering or unlawfully attempting to interfere. It is also part of what the law is prescribing an offense. And for this, anybody found to be in contravention of these provisions, that they have unlawfully accessed or they have unlawfully attempted to access, they have unlawfully interfered with a computerized system, or they have unlawfully attempted to interfere, we are talking about a possible fine and or an imprisonment term and or an imprisonment term the amounts in terms of the fine we could go all the way to 10 million and in terms of the imprisonment we could go all the way up to 10 years you may notice the stiffness of the fines and the imprisonment is in a bid to act as a deterrent that they will be so stiff they are going to be so harsh so that we we discourage any unlawful access or unlawful interferences with this computerized system that hosts uh, this information. So as you can see, the, the law has tried as much as possible to have these measures towards the safeguarding uh, of the information held in these systems. But this does not stop the individual institutions, the central depository system, uh, towards having their own extra measures, their own extra prohibitions and sanctions towards their own employees, towards the central depository systems, just to ensure that this information that they have is safeguarded or is very secure. Now, I'll move on to matters disclosure of information. We have seen how secured this information has been. Let us see how this information may then be shared. Disclosure of information, disclosure of information. Now, as we look at the disclosing of information held by the depository system and maybe by the central depository agents, it is important that we underscore the fact that there is a legal requirement that there should be no disclosures of, of information generally. And this speaks to the security of this information. This speaks to the investor confidence that we want to instill, that these investors are not going to have the information disclosed or shared by the central depository or the central depository agents or even the securities exchange. But having said that, the law provides us with exceptions. And within these exceptions, we find circumstances where this information held by the central depository or the central depository agents may be shared under the following circumstances. One, as you would of course expect, would be with consent. So if the central depository or the central depository agents have been given consent by the, ho the, uh, the holders of these securities accounts, then we're saying in such exceptional cases, they may proceed on to share this information and it will not be a violation of the law. The other situation would be in respect to bankruptcy bankruptcy or insolvency proceedings. So this is where these bankruptcy proceedings or the insolvency proceedings are as affecting the information that the disclosure of this information is for the benefit of the central depository or the benefit of the central depository agent or even the securities exchange. In such proceedings, then this information may be disclosed. Uh, the other exception we have is in respect to civil proceedings would be in respect to civil proceedings and in particular regard this is where we have uh, the holders of these securities um, accounts being subject to a civil process in court where a court order may have been given against the central depository or the central depository agent uh, agent requiring them to disclose particular information that they hold uh, for the ho for these account holders remember 
court orders are not suggestions. There is an obligation on every other person to whom a court order has been made to comply with these orders. It is actually an offense not to comply with court orders. We call it contempt of court. The other uh, scenario where we have an exception where this information may be disclosed is in respect to audits. So if to facilitate an auditor, uh, the central depository or the central depository agent has some information that may facilitate the audit, then in such cases it is allowed to have these disclosures. We may also have investigations. So in respect to any investigations that have been ordered against maybe a central depository or a central depository agent, then to enable these investigations to bear their fruit or to meet their objectives, then information may also be shared exceptionally. Then for the purposes of records, for the purposes of maintaining records in respect to transactions, we have to be very clear what kind of information for records we have to give. If this information is given for the purposes of keeping records that this central depository and the central depository agents have an obligation to, then under such circumstances, information may be disclosed and it will not be amounting to a breach of the obligations that these parties have to keep secret or to keep secure information. So that is matters disclosure. Maybe we can now conclude by looking at the central depository guarantee fund. So we also have the central, the central depository uh, guarantee, the central depository guarantee fund. The central depositories are required by law to have. Now this fund is usually a condition. It is usually a condition to the license that will be granted to the central depository by the Capital Markets Authority. So while we make an application to be registered or to be licensed to operate a central depository, one of the requirements by the Capital Markets Authority is that the respective central depository must have with it a guarantee fund. Now this fund guarantees the settlement of all transactions by in investors through that respective uh, depository. Remember uh, this idea of the investor confidence that we want to restore. How confident are investors that any instructions they give towards the depository would be affected? Now with the possibilities of losses, then this guarantee fund comes in handy that it guarantees the settlement of any transactions that may be ordered through this particular depository. So when making an application for this license from the CMA, then it is contingent that this central depository must have with it a guarantee fund. Now, from the onset, there's a requirement that the central depository makes a deposit to this fund of a minimum of 1.5 million. And, this, and these numbers could go up depending on the intention of the transactions that this central depository wants to carry out. Uh, towards this fund, we will also have any penalties that may be levied uh, against the central depository agents. Any such penalties are also remitted towards this guarantee fund. Again, monies generated as interest from investing the funds of this guarantee form generally what we have as the guarantee fund. This fund will be managed again by the central depository acting as that guarantee for the settlement of transactions through the particular central depository. So dear class, that brings us to the end of our second lesson on matters, the central depository system. Just to recap what we have done so far, we have looked at the central depository corporation, which is a particular company incorporated in Kenya as a central depository. We have looked at the rules for establishment, the duties of the depository, and the requirement that we must have rules as a central depository by which we will play by, and so will the agents that we may register. So we have also looked at the criteria for registering the central depository agents and the specific functions that these agents are expected to discharge. 
We have also looked at the security measures. This is important for our confidence that we have uh, offenses that have actually been prescribed by the Act for violating these security measures. We have gone on to look at the specific disclosures that we may make that are exceptionals, that will not constitute a breach of the security information security measures that the law imposes on the central depository. And finally, we have made a mention of the guarantee fund, which is a contingent, a condition for the application of every license uh, to a central depository. I wish now to refer you to uh, the past papers by which, by the way, you could get this from the website. You can just download them from the website and check them. So we have a few questions that I would want to refer you to as your assignment, just to help you look at what we have done today. Um, you can go to September 2015, which is the pilot paper. There is a question number 4B, which reads, Outline six matters that should be provided for in the CDS rules by a central depository system. Then uh, you can also turn to November 2015. There is a question number two, which is asking you to prepare a summary of the rules governing the establishment of a central depository. There is a question number two B, again, which is asking you to highlight four examples of the contents of a central depository guarantee fund. Then you may also want to go to May 2016, question number two. They're asking you to advise on the documents that must accompany an application to operate a central depository agent. Then they are also asking you to describe four continuing obligations that every central depository agent uh, must meet. Um, we have more. You can also look at question number three of May 2016. They are asking you to explain the legal provisions relating to the following records and accounts that a central depository should maintain and matters relating to audit of records and accounts maintained by the central depository. Then we also have November 2016. They're asking you to describe offenses that have been committed in an above case study. November 2016, question number two, there is a case study uh, relating to information held in the computerized system. So what specific offenses have been committed and then they're also asking you to cite the penalties uh, for the offenses above. So, dear learners, that brings us to the end of our class and effectively the end of our considerations on the central depository systems. I may want to add this is an important part of the syllabus and forms the bulk of very many questions you are going to come across in your revision. So, I kindly request that you put a lot of effort to understand this topic. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to get yourself a copy of our professionally prepared study texts and revision partners.